Welcome back. A freshman Democrat is calling on House Oversight Committee Chairman James Comer to release the transcript from Monday's closed door interview with Devin Archer on Capitol Hill. Newsmax national correspondent Logan Raddick is joining us now with the latest. Logan, good morning. Rob, good morning. Still no transcript from that closed door interview with Devin Archer in front of the House Oversight Committee. So the only information we know is coming from members of that committee, whether they be Republicans like Chairman James Comer or the lone Democrat to attend that meeting, Congressman Dan Goldman of New York. And Goldman went on CNN Monday night to call for the release of the transcript. I would urge Chairman Comer, rather than to continue to send out uh, misinformation about what transpired in the, uh, the transcribed interview, to actually put out the transcript, which he can do as soon as he wants. And an oversight committee aide tells Newsmax that the transcript can only be released after it goes through a review process. And then once it is provided by the court reporter, it will have to be uh, sent to Archer for him to review for corrections. But Goldman also says that Archer testified that Hunter Biden sold the illusion of access to his father. His exact testimony was that he had a Hunter Biden possessed actual experience and contacts in Washington, D.C., in the political sphere, in the lobbying sphere, in the executive branch, and that he was, that that is ultimately what he was providing to Burisma. And Congressman Goldman also claimed that Archer said that Joe Biden only spoke to Hunter Biden's business associates about the weather. And this is how Chairman Comer responded to that claim with our own Greg Kelly Monday night. None of these people that he put his dad on the business phone with are reputable business people. They all are under some type of investigation or on the flea in the countries where they originate from. The people that that Hunter Biden was putting on speakerphone with his sitting vice president father were some of the worst people on the planet, but yet they were paying the Biden family millions and millions of dollars. And Goldman thinks that every American is going to believe the fact that, oh, well, they just talked about the weather. And Chairman Gomer says it wasn't just phone calls that Joe Biden made. He also cited a meeting at Cafe Milano, a restaurant here in Washington, D.C., in which Hunter Biden and his associates with Joe Biden, who was then vice president, attended a dinner with Elena Baturina, a Russian oligarch who's the widow of the former mayor of Moscow. Republicans also say that Archer said that Hunter Biden referred to Joe Biden as, quote, my guy. And Chairman Comer says all roads lead to Joe Biden as his investigation continues. Back to you. All right, appreciate that update, Logan. That's the story we should be talking about today, but we've got another one of those pesky Trump indictments to talk about this morning, uh, and that will dominate the news on the other networks, I'm sure. Thank you, Logan Raddick. I uh, want to keep the conversation going now and welcome in former New Jersey Superior Court Judge Andrew Napolitano and former prosecutor and constitutional law attorney Amir Benno. Great to have you both on uh, the case. Uh, Judge Napolitano, to me, just does not make sense. Here's a line from page one, uh, indictment number three against Donald Trump. The president, this is a quote, lied about election fraud and knew there was no fraud. Judge, you've been at it for a long time. How are you going to prove what Donald Trump knew and did not know? Very difficult uh, to do so. The uh, indictment, which uh, we, we call a speaking indictment because it contains a lot of evidence in it. it actually has a lot more in there than most indictments normally do uh, claims that this information will come from the circle of people around Donald Trump. Now, there are six co-conspirators unidentified in the indictment and not charged. My guess is that those conspirators or alleged co-conspirators have agreed to testify against him. If Rudy Giuliani testifies against him, if John Eastman testifies against him, against them. If Jeffrey Clark, uh, the former uh, Justice Department official whom he wanted to name acting attorney general, testify against them, it'll be devastating for the president. If they don't, then the government has a very difficult job proving what was in Donald Trump's brain and what he intended to do by this. Yeah, and that's that's the goal. They'll throw the book at these these six unidentified people we know in Florida. Walt Nada, 
uh, Trump assistant and then the head of maintenance down at Mar-a-Lago, Amir. He was in court in Florida on Monday, Carlos de Oliveira. Uh, so that's what the DOJ is trying to do. They're trying to get people to turn on the former Correct. president. Correct. Um, the reason those two folks in Florida were indicted is because they refused to cooperate with the DOJ. Right. I'm suggesting that the reason the six co-conspirators have not been indicted is because they are cooperating with the DOJ, and that's bad news for the former president. Okay, and, and Rudy, Rudy Giuliani could be on that list. That's a possibility? It's pretty clear that co-conspirator number one is Rudy Giuliani, even his uh, lawyer, Bob Costello, very, very fine lawyer and a terrific guy, right. acknowledged this much uh, to the New York Times last night. Okay, uh, Amir, Jonathan Turley, respected attorney, uh, called this, these are quotes, a free speech killing indictment, the criminalization of political speech, and an attack on the First Amendment. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, let's let's look at U.S. versus Alvarez. Okay, 2012. That's the stolen valor case. That's what Professor Turley's talking about. Supreme Court did, ruled six three that you have the First Amendment protects your light, your right to say things that aren't true. If in fact Donald Trump didn't believe that he won, which again is probably a bridge too far, because uh, everybody, by all outward indications, can tell that he believes, rightly or wrongly, that he won the election. Uh, but he, if he believed that, in fact, Joe Biden won, his saying that this was a stolen election is constitutionally protected. Now, obviously, there are areas of uh, lies that fall outside of constitutional protections, such as if you're defrauding somebody or if you're inciting violence. But the Supreme Court has also been very careful to limit what fraud is. Just this past May, they narrowed the definition of fraud to trying to bilk somebody out of money or property. Right. That is not this case. There's no allegation that Donald Trump was trying to bilk people out of money or property. Now, it would have been one thing if, if Jack Smith said, look, we're going to go after his fundraising as a result of these allegations of a stolen election and that he misused funds. That would have been a sort of cookie cutter run-of-the-mill fraud case that does involve money, but he chose not to do that. Instead, he's going after the riot on January 6th, after the slate of contingent electors, the pressure put on Mike Pence to, to not count electoral votes, and he's saying all of this is fraud. None of that is consistent with the Supreme Court's decisions. And, of course, we always get back to that. He can't be responsible for the riot because that kind of speech saying go peacefully protest is protected by yet another Supreme Court decision called Brandenburg. Right. So right. they're running up into hurdle after hurdle after hurdle. And if they pursue these kind of novel legal theories, they're going to find uh, this indictment thrown in the wastebasket. Peacefully and patriotically. Judge, do you think we see a trial before the 2024 election? Jack Smith said yesterday he wants a speedy trial. Of course, he's going to say that. Well, the, the government is rarely ready and always says they want a speedy trial, as my colleague, the former uh, prosecutor, uh, knows. If I were Jack Smith, I would try and get a trial before the Miami trial, and that's probably what he's going to try and do. Uh, uh, knowing Jack, knowing the federal uh, mentality, uh, knowing what they're up against in the Mar-a-Lago case, I think they want to either try both cases at once or they want to try this one in D.C., first. Uh, and then, Amir, just a quick one, about 30 seconds. This judge, Tanya Chutkin, um, formerly represented a fraudulent blood testing company while working at a law firm associated with Hunter Biden. Isn't that a conflict right there? No, I don't know that, that just the fact that you've represented uh, individuals who might be somehow associated with uh, somebody who is related to, uh, to an adversary of the defendant or uh, who may have represented party that has uh, questionable uh, positions on things would warrant uh, recusal. Uh, obviously, if there is a demonstrated bias, that would be one thing. But uh, just throwing those things against the wall is not enough. Okay. Um, Judge Andrew Napolitano, Amir Benno, we appreciate you being with us this morning. Uh, we will sure. uh, continue to spotlight this story throughout the day. Thank you. Thanks. All right.